Would you turn, please, to Luke's account of the life, the life of the Lord Jesus and chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And for the sake of context, we'll read it verse 1. Luke chapter 15 and verse 1. Then drew near unto him, that is, to the Lord Jesus, all the publicans and sinners, tax gatherers and sinners, for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man is sick with sinners, and he did with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need or in the context we're looking at, really the Lord is saying, which feel they have no need of repentance. I have a, a friend who's a school teacher, and interestingly enough, his wife is a school teacher too which means that they both have the same time frame for vacations. So just about July every year, they take off and they go somewhere across the country. They have a little trailer and they drive. And many times they'll say something like, if you ever get to Montana, for instance, if you ever, ever get to Montana, don't miss Glacier. That's a, just an incredible park. Or uh, don't, don't forget to go to Yellowstone or uh, Yosemite and things like that. And really he tells you, be sure not to miss. You ever have somebody say that to you? Listen, this is a great place. When you go there, be sure to go there. Don't miss this. Now, I would like to tell you tonight the place that you don't want to miss. And that's heaven. Heaven. In chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke, the Lord Jesus is giving us a portrait of God. He's telling us what God, the triune God, is like. But included with that, as if just a a side topic, or if you could think of it like a window opening for us to look through, it gives us a glimpse into heaven. And 10 times, 10 times, he uses words like joy or rejoicing, because he's telling us that heaven is a place of boundless joy. And the thing that gives heaven joy and the angels in heaven joy, and of course, the heart of God joy, is when God rescues a human being and saves that person when he becomes, as we've just been hearing, a child of God, God becomes his father, and that person will be in heaven forever. Now, I have been in homes. I don't have an artistic bone in my body, so I have to tell you this. I have been in homes where the artistry of the host or hostess has put me in awe, where their, their ingenuity or their creativity or whatever it was when they built the house, or had it built, just I'd say to myself, I would never have thought of that. I have friends, and um, just because of where they built their house on a slight rise, way at the top, they built like a loft, but not like a dormer, 360 degrees windows all the way around, and they're commanding this gorgeous view off of the distance of the harbor and all around them. I was used to stay in a home here in New Jersey, and they had put into the, uh, into the bathroom that everyone used, they put a shower that had five shower heads. Two on either side and one at the top. It was like being in a car wash, you know, waiting for the, the rubber fingers to come down and, and dry you off. I wouldn't have thought of something like that. I remember a builder taking me uh, one day, said, let me show you the home that I'm building. Uh, not for himself, he was, he was building it to sell. And just, just this gorgeous setting of a, of, a, of a study area in rich red wood. And then just the porch outside, we stepped outside onto this porch and had this commanding view of the area. It was gorgeous. And so I think to myself, if we, humans, with all of our limitations, can build a home that is stunning in its beauty, what must God's home be like? What must God and his heaven be like? Because heaven is going to display what God is like. Notice the happiness of heaven. The Lord Jesus describes heaven's joy in the rescue of a lost sheep. Later on, he'll describe it again in the recovery of some money that was lost. And then finally, he will describe a father who has recovered a boy that had wandered away. And he talks about the joy of that father receiving that one-time prodigal son. 
heaven rejoices in this. Just think of rescues that we know of. When you, when you read of people being rescued from a, a cave-in in a mine or a ship that was sinking and they had been rescued or uh, an airline that was stricken and was, and was coming in on fire and they were able to rescue the passengers from the plane. What gives God joy is to save people so that they can live with him in heaven forever. When my oldest child, Peter, was just a young toddler, we came out of a gospel meeting in a place called Longport, New Jersey. Uh, if your father's here, you know about the balancing act. So I had him on this side, and I was loosely holding my Bible in this hand in a bag. And I had also the bag with all the things for a child, right? And so at that time, I was driving a little TC3, and it had a fairly large bumper on the back. Here's what happened. Get out to the car. I fished for my keys. I unlocked the door for my wife. Went around to the back. I put the bag down. I put my Bible bag on the bumper. Put the key in. Turned it. Opened the hatch. Put the bag in. Closed the hatch, walked around to the side where the baby car seat was, put it in the car seat, walked around to my side, got up the engine, drove home, pulled into the driveway at home, reached back for my Bible, and got a mental picture. Right at that point, I got a mental picture of putting that Bible on my buffer. But no mental picture of taking it off. <laughs> Now, the next day, this was September, the next day there was a nor'easter, not snow, but rain, a nor'easter that was just bombing the Jersey coast. I can remember to this day, my wife in the car, just a little bit ahead of me, and I'm walking the rain just absolutely soaking me, and I'm just checking the side of the road, all the way from that building, that gospel hall, all the way over the causeway, checking, checking the side, nothing, absolutely. Lost my body. Lost the notebook that was in the Bible. I am in Nova Scotia. It's January now. That was September. I'm in Nova Scotia. And my wife calls me and says, guess what came in the mail today? So what? She said, your Bible. And there was a note. And the man said, we went down to close our house at the shore and to make sure it was safe from the snow that was coming. And I found this bag on a snowbank. Now, I was in Longport. This was in Ocean City. So we're just talking about a distance of, what, 10, 15 miles? And four or five months later? And he said, I opened it up. I saw a name and an address. And it looked to me like it was pretty well marked. And I thought it might be important. So here it is. Do you know how happy I was to receive that money? You left your, you left your wallet or your purse in the washroom at the rest stop, you forgot, it. you got back in the car and you drew, and then five miles later, you remember, and you couldn't wait to get to the next exit that you turn, maybe even illegally use what the police use, and you head back, and then you come back the other way, and you pull in, and you run into the rest stop, and there it is. It'll never happen, by the way, but there it is. <laughs> nobody, nobody touched it. Your wallet's sitting there. Your purse is sitting there. How would you feel? Multiply that by infinity. And that's the joy that floods God's heart when he rescues a human being so that that person can live forever with him. That's the joy, the happiness of heaven. But of course, the holiness of heaven is a tremendous thing. Heaven is not going to be tainted or stained or marred or ruined by what has tainted and stained and marred and ruined our society. Sin, it will never enter there. Therefore, there will never be any of the effects of sin, no crime, no disease. No heartache, no, no party, no saying goodbye. Here's how the Bible puts it. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Right, for these things are true and faithful. There is a world I'm traveling to, a home I have beyond this world, and sin is never going to enter it. And I look at this world and I think of what a beautiful world God made. And it's a world that has been plagued by sin. And again, I say, what kind of a world must heaven be? Where sin has never and will never enter. Where death will never penetrate 
where tears and sorrow and pain will never be felt. I had the great privilege of preaching a number of times with a, just a tremendous Irish gospel preacher named Mr. Sidney Maxwell. There was a, there was a crisis came into his life that wounded him for the rest of his life. His daughter and her husband went on vacation from Vancouver to Palm Springs, California. She stepped off the curb and never saw the car driven by the drunk driver, who apparently never saw her. And quicker than I can tell you, his daughter Margaret was gone. And every time that I ever preached with him, every time from then on, whenever he got around to the topic of heaven, I knew what he was thinking. Sometimes he'd actually say it. I had a dear girl. I, he'd go into it just briefly. But other times he would just use the poem. See? And he'd start to talk about heaven. And he would talk about there'll never be crape on the doorknob. No funeral trains in the sky. No graves on the hillsides of glory. For there we shall never more die. The old would be young there forever. Transformed in a moment of time. Immortal will stand in his likeness. The stars and the sun to outshine. I'm bound for that beautiful city. Are you? Are you on the way to heaven? This is the place you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss this place. This is the home of God. And you don't want to miss heaven because of what it is. But you don't want to miss heaven because of what it has. You see, in heaven, Christians have exactly what my dear preaching partner, Mr. Baker, has been telling you. We have a father. We have a father. God was not always my father. He was always my creator. But he wasn't always my father. Until on July the 10th, 1966, I trusted his son, the Lord Jesus. And at that point, I was adopted into the family of God. There are people sitting all around you here who have a moment in life when he or she trusted Christ. And that person was adopted into the family of God. And so the title the Bible uses is a child of God. A child of God. Now, God is my father. God has a lot of families. In one sense, he has families of angels, families of cherubim, families of seraphim. But the nearest and dearest family he has is the family of his children, people who have been saved by the Lord Jesus. On one occasion, when the disciples returned from a successful preaching campaign, the Lord Jesus told them not to rejoice over that. He said, here's what to be happy about. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He was referring to what the Bible calls the book of life. And the book of life is the register, the roll call, if you will. And every person who becomes saved knows that his name is in that book. Is your name in the book of life? Are you on the way to heaven? Is God your father? You say, well, I'm very confused by this. I've never heard this kind of thing. Well, just ask yourself the question, was there ever a time somewhere in this world, someday in your life, when you personally trusted the Lord Jesus as the way to get to heaven, as the Savior? Because that is how a person becomes a child of God. You know what else I have in heaven? I have a friend. I have the best friend a human being can have. He's called the friend of sinners. And he redeemed me by dying for me. That is the Lord Jesus. You see, going to heaven is not like moving into a retirement home. It's not like, you know, if, if I've never moved into a retirement home yet. Um, but nobody has to say, okay, now this is where you sit. This is where you eat. And now, now this is Mary. This is John. Man. Heaven is my home. What they're doing in heaven. I started doing in 1966. You know what it was? Thanking God for the Lord Jesus. Somebody once asked Neil Armstrong, obviously the first man to walk on the road, what was it like? You know, to step on that ladder, to drop down on the lunar surface, make that, that famous statement. What was it like? He said, I felt like I had been there a thousand times before. Well, what did he mean? He'd never been to the moon surface before. He'd never touched down on the lunar surface before. What did he mean? I felt like I had been there a thousand times before. He had gone over and over and over in his mind, see, preparing for this moment when he would actually be on the moon. 
On July the 10th, 1966, I found out that the Lord Jesus died for me. That if I would trust him alone, he would take me to heaven. I would be safe. I would be saved. That's exactly what I did. I took him as my savior. And the first thing, the first thing, and I am sure, if you ask other people here, I'm sure that there are many people with the same experience. Once I was sure I was saved, the first thing I did was, I just said thanks to God. Thank, thank you for saving me. I've been doing that ever since. I'm, I'm going to do that forever. So when I get to heaven, it won't be something strange or different. Because you see, everybody who is going to be in heaven has personally trusted and therefore personally knows the Lord Jesus. This is so different from religion. You're not being told by God tonight that here are rituals to keep or here is an organization to join. You're being told tonight that here is a savior to trust, a redeemer to trust. And if you do, he will save you. I can tell you about this friend. He loved me before I was born. He loved me before I was born. And he gave his life for me. He went to the cross and died for me. That's the kind of friend I'm telling you. Just one year ago this month, a former college football player and an ex-Marine, his name was Philip Lights, made the most important catch in his life. I think you could probably look this up on the video or the story would still be online. There was an apartment complex on fire in Phoenix, Arizona. And there was a woman who was burned to death. And with her last bit of energy, with the last strength that she could, she took her little baby and threw it out of the balcony. And down below, Philip Blanks, he saw a man positioning to catch the baby. He thought, I don't think he's going to do it. So Philip Blanks, like he was moving in front of a, of a defender to catch the ball. He moved in front of the man and he caught that baby. And saved him. He said, she's the real hero of the story. Because she made the ultimate sacrifice to save her child. That's understandable, isn't it? But a mother, if she couldn't do anything else, would see to the safety of her son or daughter or child. That's, that, that's so understandable. Here's what I will never understand. Why the Lord Jesus would die for me. Why the Son of God from heaven would come to die for me. Do you know that 25 people, at least 25 people died in Henan province in China just the other day because of torrential rains that introduced floods into the area. So 25 people, now there are, there are 1.4 plus billion people, billion people in China. How much do you think the 25 people were noticed outside of the small circle of their relatives? How much do you think the authorities in the capital concerned themselves with 25 lives out of Billions of people. I read that. I think I read that this morning. Hardly thought about it through the day. We don't tend to spend equal amount of time on every human being that we know or every sad story that we hear. But think of what it meant for the Lord Jesus to look at a world that was teeming with sin and animosity toward God, knowing that when he came, he would be murdered, and yet knowing that the only way to save me from hell was to die for me. The Bible says God displays his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved me before I was born and died for me. He loved me when I was in my sins and saw to it, he saw to it that I would hear the gospel. I mentioned earlier in the meetings that when my grandfather came from Italy, he had, he had a choice confronting him, whether he would go to Argentina or whether he would come to Philadelphia. 
He came to Philadelphia, met a fellow Italian who was a believer, a Christian, who gave him a Bible. And for the first time in his life, my grandfather read these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he had never heard in his life before that it was possible to have everlasting life now. And to know now where you will be when you die. He trusted what God said and was saved. That brought the gospel into his family and obviously into mine. So I think to myself, what would have happened had he gone to Argentina? How different would my life have been? How different his life would have been? And therefore, how different the life of my mother would have been? But you see, in his kindness, God, God arranged it. I have a friend who loved me before I was born, who loved me when I was in my sins, who loved me when I refused his grace. When I had no interest in him. There was a young woman. I'm going to leave her name out. She was 18 years of age. This is just going back a couple of years ago. She was a promising stage actress whose life was absolutely empty. She left a Greenwich Village, New York party bent on ending her life in the Hudson. Walking. It's nighttime. Walking through the streets. Her mind all absorbed with the fact that she's going to end her life. There's a group of Christians standing there. She's not even aware what they're doing. See? But she had to make her way through. Oh, she, excuse me, pardon. Make her way through. Gets to the edge of the Hudson and suddenly realizes she's holding a piece of paper in her hand. She wasn't even conscious of it. It was a gospel paper. When she had forced her way through those Christians, somebody had offered paper, a gospel paper to her, and she didn't even realize she took it. She looked at it. She read it. That was a paper telling her about God's love for sinners. And Christ can save your life and deliver you from your sins. When she tells how she was saved, she describes standing on the edge of the Hudson and saying, all that stood between me and an eternal hell was one thin piece of paper. One thin piece of paper. If I had not read that, she said, I would have gone in and I would have perished. Who arranged circumstances like that? Who has brought you here? Who has influenced you to come and listen to the gospel? Who has brought into your life some man, some woman? Who has told you about the Lord Jesus? It is an indication of how much this friend loves you. So glad I know him. I can tell I can tell you about this friend that he has loved me despite my many failures. He has never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's never given up on me. He has been with me through every sorrow and every disappointment. In fact, he softens every sorrow and sweetens every joy. He has comforted and counseled. He is the best friend you could have. And if you knew him tonight, you would have somebody who would be by your side every day of your life. There aren't a lot of things in life that I can recommend to you wholeheartedly. I can recommend to you unreservedly, wholeheartedly, completely. This wonderful friend of sinners. Tell you that if you trust him tonight, he'll bring you home to heaven to live forever. I don't have time to tell you about the family that I have in heaven. It's the best family. I, I belong to the best family to say it. No, no, not, not the family that has my last name, but God's family. And I'm going to be with the greatest people who have ever lived. I'm going to be with them. Yeah, nobody. I'm going to be with the Abrahams and the Apostle Pauls and the Peters and the Whitfields and the Wesleys. I'm going to be with the saints and believers from all ages. And I am and part of the family that they are part of. And I have a future that cannot be matched. And I'm telling you all of that because I hope with all my heart. My brother and I hope with all our hearts. The Christians who are sponsoring these meetings, we together hope with all our hearts that heaven will become your home tonight. And of all the things you might miss and of all the places you might never get to, 
that you will not miss him. I want to close by telling you, you don't want to miss being in heaven because of what it means. Because what it means. To be in heaven means you will never die and go to hell. Now, if I had nothing more to tell you than that tonight, that ought to just pique the interest of every person here. The Lord Jesus is offering to save you from the worst disaster that can come into the life of a person here. He can save you from dying in your sins, save you from going into hell because of those sins. He can bring you to heaven. Being in heaven means you will never stand at the great white throne to be condemned. I know that we often bandy about the terms the day of judgment, but when you read the description in Revelation 20, you realize how absolutely terrifying that scene is when the great white throne is set up. And the unsaved are brought out of their graves, their bodies, and their souls from hell. And they're standing before the Lord Jesus. And he's holding the books in his hand, the book of their life, their works, showing all the sins that they have committed. The book of life. And it says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. To be saved and in heaven means you will never face that judgment. You will never be sent away from God into the lake of fire. It means you will never perish. You will be safe for a while. Now, is there anybody in the way? So I'm not asking for a show of hands. Just in the quiet of your own thinking process. For anybody in the way? You would like to be sure that when your life is done, you will be in hell. This book says there is no church in the world that can give you that assurance. This book says, there is no man in this world who can give you that assurance. This book says, there is nothing you can do to earn that or buy that or deserve that assurance. But this book says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you can be saved. He'll find you tonight. Like the shepherd finding the sheep will put you on his shoulders. It's only two times in our Bible. I, one time that we read about his shoulders, and the other time is his shoulder. And when it describes his coming kingdom, those famous words by Isaiah, when he wrote, The government shall be upon his shoulder, shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace, the government on his shoulder. But when it comes to saving a helpless sinner, he tells us it's like a shepherd putting a sheep on his shoulders, devoting all of his power to see to it. That a person who has trusted him will never perish. I have a friend in Connecticut. So I'm talking about somebody else. I have a friend in Connecticut. His mother was watching television one day, and the head of her church was speaking, and he said something to the effect of this: that even he, even he was not certain that he would be in heaven of death. She thought to herself, he doesn't know where he's going to be when he dies. My son knows from the Bible that he's going to be in heaven. I think I better start listening to my son. To find out how I can be sure I will be in heaven. And you know, we have four biographies of the Lord Jesus that were inspired by God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three, they're called synoptic gospels. They often write the same things from different angles. Those three all end with references to heaven in their last chapter. And the fourth gospel, John, ends with reminding us how soon the Lord Jesus will come back to take us to heaven. So would you understand what I mean when I say that this is the most important thing in your life? Here we are, just two ordinary men. In a tent. You're listening tonight to the most important thing in your life. Where you will be in God's eternity. Please make sure your life is done, that you will be 